please welcome the global CEO of JLL Hotels and Hospitality, Hilda Perez Alvarado, and the CEO of Highgate, Arash Azarbazan, for a conversation with Skift Senior Hospitality Editor, Sean O'Neill. So Hilda, you've been on a world tour for the past month. Uh, you've been talking to a lot of uh, hotel investors and uh, owners. So what's been on their minds? Oh my God, everything. Where do we start? Um, obviously the headwinds that we're facing right now. So we just heard in the other panel, inflation, labor issues, uh, supply chain issues with what's happening in China right now, geopolitical tensions. But, that, but at the same time, they're trying to make sense of this great return and change in consumer behavior and the fact that we don't see travel pulling back just yet. So just trying to, to look into their crystal, crystal ball, but they're asking all the right questions. Okay. Uh, you, in the past couple of years, you've uh, coordinated the sale of some very high profile assets. Uh, and then in light of the past few days, we have the sale of uh, Brookfield uh, buying for $3.8 billion in cash, Watermark, a hotel REIT. With your eye on what's popular in the market, what kind of attributes or portfolios are pretty particularly attractive right now? I think it's a little bit of everything, okay? So, of course, people are looking at yields. Mm -hmm. people, are, people are looking at, you know, if the asset hasn't stabilized, when is it going to stabilize? Those assets that have been doing very well, like the drive to resorts, for example, how sustainable is that? Mm -hmm. Right with inflationary pressures, what happens to disposable income? What happens to demand? So you know that's people are trying to solve that. I think we have a much uh, better bet on the return of corporate travel. So people are starting, investors are starting to look at urban assets that have that weekend leisure component. So that's interesting. And then if you go around the world, especially in Europe and in Asia, we're having conversations about alternative forms of accommodation, co-living being the most prominent. Okay. So we heard earlier uh, Steve uh, Hafner from Kayak and Tyler Morse from MCR. They had a little bit of debate. Uh, Steve, uh, Steve is a bit more bullish that some of these consumer behavior trends are more durable. Uh, Tyler was a little more skeptical. So when you see buyers like investing on some of these trends, what kind of advice does JLL Capital uh, believe? You believe that that's a, a sound forward-looking strategy? Absolutely. Listen, I, you just got to look at the demographic trends, right? And the fact that our industry is not static, the world is not static. The way uh, millennials and Generation Z consume and invest is very different <laughs> than their predecessors. So we're, we're paying uh, attention to that. And also investors have diff very different criteria. You have evergreen funds, you have private funds, and then um, you know, a lot of our Asian investors like to, to refer to the U.S. as the world's biggest trading market. And these are money managers who are investing. They have to invest. Their duration of their investment is very short, three to five years maybe. So it's very different criteria. The last point that I will make is we are hearing more and more about ESG. Okay. Um, and this isn't just a trend and, you know, just doing the right thing, uh, given that a lot of consumers and employers are very value driven. But, you know, with the energy crisis that we have going on right now in Europe, uh, inflationary pressures, et cetera, and obviously the effects of climate change, this is something that all investors are looking at, especially the institutional investors. Okay, I want to come back to ESG in a moment, but let's bring Araj into the conversation. How are you doing? Very good. Uh, I'm wondering, consumer behavior. Skift has always been very fanatically obsessed about using the consumer lens to try, try to anticipate how travel brands should adjust their product or marketing. So for your team at Highgate, you have about 540 hotels under management, I believe. We're, we're trying to catch up with Tyler. Where's Tyler? <laughs> Did he leave already? How, we're, we're, how many properties do you have at, uh, under, uh, how many rooms would you say? Are at uh, you know, we're the second largest hotel company management company, and we have 90,000 hotels on the contract. So Tyler at uh, 22,000 hotel rooms on the contract, there's got to be nobody between us at third. So okay. uh, we, we are a hotel management company. Also, like Tyler, we invest in, in property. So we own and we manage for others, and we operate as well. Um, 130 fully branded hotels and about 400 and some uh, select service hotels. 
fantastic. Yeah. So to build a bit on like what Hilda was saying, so are there particular consumer behaviors that you have your team at Highgate, you feel like it's important for them to be on because you believe you need to evolve either the product or the marketing as a result? You know, it's all about making a connection with the guests at whatever level of hospitality we have. From a, from a five diamond property that we have in Boston called the Newberry to a Furfield Inn in La Quinta. We, we don't take anything for granted. I think when a hotel becomes a commodity is when it starts you know, losing value and losing that connection with the guests. But you know, the, the difference, I mean, again, we, we partner with, with you know, all the online travel agencies. We're not, we're not a fighter with them. We, we rather work with the online travel agencies like Kayak and Expedia and Booking instead of saying you can't book at our hotels. We, we find those value propositions for our owners and ourselves as owners to be able to make a much better outcome than, than having you know, to cut them out of what we do. Are some of your brands like very good with direct? Like, do you have a very high direct? Uh, absolutely. I mean, we have hotels that are you know 40, 50 percent uh, direct business. We have hotels in the in the Keys right now that are 60, 70 percent direct business. But Highgate hasn't been in the business of building brands. You know, we manage other folks' brands and we build independent brands. I mean, I bet you didn't know that we we are the lar maybe Tyler is bigger than us now, but we are the largest operator of hotels in New York City. We have over 35 hotels that we operate in New York City. And you know, Knickerbocker is a hotel that we, we, we managed, and, and so is the Smith, and so is the James. Uh, so there is not that many customer connections, to your point, as far as, and that's one of the things that we are changing. We want so so I've, we've noticed at Skip that there seems to be more business-to-business -business branding of Highgate itself. So usually at hotel conferences, we're talking about uh, consumer-facing brands like Four Seasons, but this is like Highgate branding. So what's the strategy there? Yeah, you hit it on the head. When I joined Highgate, I mean, we all in the industry know Highgate. I mean, people outside, our customers don't know they're checking into a Highgate-managed hotel. And that's what I was brought in to do as a CEO, to make Highgate a B2C company. Uh, for, for us to have a Highgate website where you can go and book 500 hotels around, and around the country knowing what to expect. You know who the manager is. I promise you there is not a select service hotel that you would go in, in Montana that, that is managed by Marriott or Hilton. They have franchisees that manage these hotels. So when you become a loyal Highgate user, you can know that at least I know that I can trust the service, I can trust that I'm taken care of, I'll be safe. And, and you know, hopefully build that loyalty uh, to the guests. So Highgate is working to become more of a B2C company instead of just a B2B company. Fascinating. So Hilda, when you evaluate deals, how important is either business to business branding or the consumer facing branding to be accretive to the value of a deal? Listen, it's a case by case basis. So, you know, as a broker, obviously our dream asset is the one that comes completely unencumbered okay. because a new investor always thinks that they can do it better. Right, so you and you want to give them optionality. So if um, you know if the brand is available, the management is available, then that's a home run. Nice. Um, obviously, there are brands that have a particular following in terms of investors. So we do have, let's say, the the forever trophy hunter out there that does <laughs> like the the Four Seasons, the Saint Regis's, the Cheval Blancs around the world, um, and then there's you know the more commercial. Uh, the, the more com commercial investor that will invest in everything else. But for us, the best is optionality. Is the market distorted by some of those investors? It, it, are, is it rational, some of the supply and demand dynamics, because you have some of these people coming at it with you know, uh, idiosyncratic maybe interests? There's always a rational, okay. okay? So when we're dealing with a sovereign wealth fund, you, know, you may scratch your head and think, <laughs> why are they buying this? <laughs> Trust me, there's always a reason. Okay. There may be a geopolitical reason for doing a deal. There may be another strategic reason for doing a deal. Um, all you got to do is, you know, get to the source of, of the money, whatever it is, it will make sense. Uh, for a lot of these forever owners, private investors, they're looking at wealth preservation. So maybe they don't look at a hotel as, you know what, I need an annual return of X. Of course, they will do it. They will underwrite it. But they're looking at is my value, is the value of my property going to improve in 10 years time, in 20 years time? You know, and therefore they're thinking more of a legacy type investment, even though they will sell from time to time. But it's a very, very different rationale. Now we've sold 
assets to investors who look at it like a piece of art or who look at it as, I don't know, their second, fifth, 20th home. Um, but you will always <laughs> find a rationale that makes sense. So that's why we call it the art of the deal. Art of the deal. Yes. Um, can, can I add something please. on that? I, I think we work together a lot and, and, and we are a big buyer of hotels. And how we look at these investments, by the way, we haven't seen a great deal since the pandemic started. I mean, I think the prices have, have held, if not increased, because the supply is shrinking a little bit, right? There hasn't been new projects announced over the pandemic and New York City, this moratorium of new hotels is coming together. So, you know, what, what we look at as a buyer, because we are, you know, Hilda's customer from time to time, is where we can add value to the hotel, where we can take a great box and make it a fantastic box. Mm -hmm. And to Hilda's point, sometimes it's difficult to change the DNA of a hotel if it's branded, if it's encumbered with a management contract, where we can add the value uh, from our effectiveness as an operator, as an owner, as a you know, executor of a brand to that asset. So that's what we look for in, in, in the world. And believe it or not, we found a few. You know, we're not buying 10 or 20 hotels today, you know, single hotels. We did buy 120 hotels in March. Uh, it was a portfolio, but we are looking methodically at, at the assets that make perfect sense for our ecosystem. Okay. I want to build on that in the sense of uh, we have a, a publication, Daily Lodging Report, and the editor uh, has been traveling around. He's been doing a lot of select service up to Lifestyle, and, and, and several of our other colleagues have been doing it. And there is a much bigger dispersion in the quality of product, places that they've been to in the past, over the past several years. The CapEx hasn't been invested in some of the places. A lot of it's really kind of run down. But it will be within the same brand, so it can be can kind of confusing. Do you feel like, is, do you feel like this is an opportunity in some way for certain orders like Highgate that are effective on the execution, or is it are consumers just not um, um, educated enough to sort of learn to find the Highgate brand, for example? You know, I think it's a big spectrum from the super luxury to the select service. I think every level of the consumer has a certain level of expectation. I don't think you can take it for granted. They won't notice the carpet is not perfect or the hotel is not clean. Everybody wants a safe, clean, fresh hotel. That's why we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars this year in, in doing PIP work for some of our select service hotels. I mean, overall, we're probably spending $450 million in renovations this year around our platform. So that's the point I was making earlier. Don't ever take your guests for granted because they might come and stay. They might not complain, but we just won't come back. Right. And that's how you work on building loyalty to making sure that you tie in. But we have found a couple of uh, opportunities. One, we, we found the Royal Lahaina in, in Hawaii. Uh, it was a kind of an off-market deal. Sorry, Hilda. <laughs> and we bought that in, 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 uh, in Hawaii and in Maui and have doubled the NOI. In, uh, we bought it in December. And it, wasn't, it was not well managed, but we brought the power of Highgate the revenue management, they were afraid to charge rates. And like Tyler said, you know, we shouldn't be afraid to charge rates. This is an oceanfront property, beautiful accommodation. Every room has ocean views. And so those are the assets that we're looking for, where we can, in phase one, improve operation, and phase two, reposition, rebrand, spend $120 million, and make it a world-class resort that Hilda can sell for us. Thank you. <laughs> So Hilda, to go back to a point you raised earlier about ESG and maybe particularly the E in ESG and particularly like climate related risk in a portfolio. What is on top of investors' minds? Uh, you, you, you know, it was topical at the conferences, you know, that you've, you've been at recently in both Asia and Europe, but then we saw the he BlackRock has sort of said that in light of the events in the Ukraine, they're not going to be backing so many shareholder resolutions that are climate focused. There's always this kind of, uh, forward, back, forward, back motion. So what, what should hotel uh, investors and owners be thinking about about the, the next couple of years? You know, I had a very similar reaction to what you just described when, you know, I was making sense of what's going on in Europe, right, and this energy crisis. And I said, wow, we've taken two, step forward, uh, two steps forward, now we're going to take three back. And actually, last week at the IHIF Hotel Conference in Berlin, it became even more pronounced that they had to focus on ways to manage their buildings in a more efficient way, okay? So 
the E in ESG doesn't mean just, you know, it's, it's not as simple as, oh, let me recycle and not change sheets and all that stuff. It's not that. It's making buildings energy efficient, mm -hmm. right? The, the built environment is responsible for 40% of all carbon production worldwide. It's enormous. Hotels is, you know, the largest contributor to, to carbon out there because we're a 24 seven business, you know, we consume a lot of water, all this stuff. We're also a big employer, but we're not focused on the S right now, we're focused on the E. Yeah. So when you have a massive energy crisis happening in Europe, of course they're focused on this. So that's one thing. It's more of a, 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 a survival, if you will, and also them focusing on, on profitability. One, two, from an investor perspective, so let's looking at it, the, the pressure from the capital, institutional investors, which are the, at the end of the day are the biggest investors in hotels, whether it's a sovereign wealth fund or a pension fund or an, you know, whatever, you name it, they are demanding, and I've seen those investment committee requirements that, you know, these investments be sustainable. And in fact, a lot of these groups are now looking at their portfolio and saying, you know what, these hotels or office buildings or commercial are not going to make it. They're too brown, we're gonna dispose of them. We're gonna keep these that are green or have the potential to be you know, uh, net carbon zero in whatever uh, their time frame is. And now this is our, our buying criteria or our building criteria or our refurb criteria. So the institutional money is demanding this, okay? And by the way, the institutional money is the one that feeds the Blackstones, the Starwoods, the Brookfields, right? They're, they're fund managers at the end of the day. And then you take the consumer side. When Booking.com is now telling you that in addition to this being a 4.8 uh, star hotel or whatever it is, that these are the ratings, they're now giving you an ESG rating, mm -hmm. right? And so again, going back to the consumer behavior, what the Generation Z wants, what the millennial wants, they are looking at this. So there's no hiding. <laughs> and I know here in the US, obviously our biggest uh, area of focus is uh, what's happening with interest rates, inflation, in Europe, you have this massive geopolitical issue. And then in Asia, they're obviously focused uh, on the fact that the second biggest market in the world is locked down. Um, I can tell you again, in those two, in Europe and in Asia, this is everything everybody talked about. And it's coming our way. Right. It's coming our, again, we are money managers in the US. The money is going to be demanding that we focus on this area. So it's enlightened self-interest to get on top of this 100%. issue. 100%. And the Ascot Residence Trust had released the first green bond, is that mm -hmm. right? How significant is that as a, a harbinger of what's to come? Listen, it was great. It was oversubscribed, proof of concept. Mm -hmm. They're thinking about you know, what to do next. We were with them right now. We actually had uh, some of our team members in Singapore who had actually subscribed to this. So yeah, this is coming. Cool. This is coming. So Arash, I want to go to a tech question, please. So we had uh, Tyler uh, from MCR. He's invested in a hotel uh, startup. Uh, we had Steve Hafner, Kai, they invested in Lifehouse, another hotel startup. And part of the thesis for that is something that we've heard echoed at some of our other conferences. I've interviewed the CEO of a Citizen M on stage. I've interviewed the CEO of Sandra on stage. They all have this theme that the traditional hospitality um, structure, particularly in Europe and North America, this split ownership where you have the brand, the management company, the owner, they're all pointing fingers at each other, you pay the tech, no, you pay the tech, is a discon it's not an organized uh, approach to technology is the claim. So do you believe that Highgate has sort of like a structural disadvantage, one arm time behind your back when it comes to being sure that you're on top of uh, the technology trends compared to some of these new uh, startups that are out there? I, I don't think so. I mean, uh, Tyler manages as many branded hotel as independent hotels, and his hand is tied just like mine on some of the challenges that we're having with some of these big hotel companies. And they're all working, spending millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in upgrading their technology and bringing it to where we are. I, I think for us, we invest in, you know, we have a full technology company that's separate and a subsidiary of Highgate that we have invested in over 15 different tech companies over the last three, four years. And we continue to go and find the next great things from, you know, the, the app that is now available and it's a native app that you don't have to, you can download one app and use it at any hotel instead of having 20 different apps for 20 different hotels. So. We are beta testing a number of different uh, solutions. But, you know, Jacob asked a great question, you know, what technology makes a great hotel a fantastic hotel? I think the key is giving the consumer the choice. 
because if you become too tech savvy that you know some people still want to have a key to open their door right if the key is not available and you're so tech forward you're going to lose some of those customers i think that's what we're trying to do in our company is giving you the choice but at the end of the day, this technology does become big brother, right? So we will follow your habits. We will understand what you ordered on room service, what time you ordered on room service, what was the problems you experienced with the room before? Did you ask someone that you know, this was wrong or what great things happened? And with that, we can try to curate your stay the next time. So we're not using that information to become NSA, but we're using that information to build to make your next stay more pleasant. And then remind you, so sorry you had an air conditioning problem last time you are here. We made sure you're in a room that air conditioning works perfectly and quietly. I mean, that doesn't make a difference for you, right? That someone recognized that you had an issue last time you were here. So I want to build on something Hilda had brought up, which is that in the North American market, uh, uh, issues about inflation and interest rates. So you have at Highgate, you know, uh, for the inputs for growth, you have cost of capital, you have uh, the cost of operations. So are you recalibrating at all because of uh, current changes? You know, like um, the panel before me said, we don't see a recession coming for the travel business. Our, our pace has been better than we have ever seen it. I mean, our, our growth as of May, f May 9th, we had meet, met our budget for the entire portfolio of room revenue usually it takes you by the 20th or 21st for you to get there. The trend has been super positive. Length of stay for us has improved. We have even seen some international travelers. We're not at 80% corporate travel yet, but we're around 40, 50%. But the, 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 the concept of belisure has started, right? It's, it's leisure and business together, like your analyst was talking about, and we're seeing a lot of that. So because of that, we haven't made any any cuts or any layoffs or we are actually hiring and bringing people on to get ready for the summer. We think this summer is going to be the best summer we've ever had. Now, fourth quarter, you know, God knows what happens with inflation and the stock market and the war and the supply chain and energy crisis, name it, we got everything coming. But I think this summer is going to be fantastic. We're just keeping a close eye on the fourth quarter to see how uh, travel trends uh, are impacted. But I'll make one caveat to that. You know, so far, because we've had this great demand as everybody's coming out of their, you know, constraints, um, the water, you know, the tide has lifted all boats. I think now that, that, you know, great return happened, if you will, and people took that dream vacation that they were saving for for two, for two years, the consumer is going to become more discerning. And so they will not accept, to your point, I think you made this earlier, if the hotel's not renovated. Mm -hmm. if the service is subpar. And so not all hotels perform equally. The, those that, you know, where the owners have been great stewards and they've been investing in infrastructure, they're going to do absolutely fine. Those that are offering something unique, those curated experiences, they're going to do fine. Is the un, um, lack of differentiation, tired properties that maybe they, they got away with it last summer or they got away with it earlier this year, they're not gonna get away with it anymore, right? And so we will see those prices drop. Um, maybe those buildings get converted to something else, who knows? But you will definitely see a very clear divide between winners and losers going forward. When the tide goes out, we'll see who's been swimming Absolutely. naked. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so let's talk about the global level, please. So for cities worldwide, which cities are sort of getting it right and making it for hospitality companies? any that invest in infrastructure and have the demographics for it. So, you know, you have, I'll give you just two, two examples here. Obviously Miami is, uh, I live there now, it's incredible what they've done. They've repositioned themselves as now a tech hub. Obviously the mayor. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. um, or crypto tech, everything uh, cool. Um, you know, it's a great quality of life. You have a lot of wealth that has moved from the Northeast and elsewhere, by the way, to South Florida. It's got fantastic infrastructure. I think you know the, their growth is very sustainable. You take a city like New York, New York's gonna be perfectly fine. And in the last few years, we've seen tremendous investment in infrastructure. You land on LaGuardia now, it's a pleasure, right? It's nice. 
Penn Station is actually nice. Which terminal? Right? Yeah, look, I, land, I got lucky. I landed in a very nice the terminal other day, today. It took me two and a half hours just to get out of the terminal. You're, you're going on the wrong <laughs> side. You know, but my point is they're investing in infrastructure. And, you know, everybody in the world wants to come to New York City. So you're always going to have that. It's, it's a talent magnet. London, it's the same thing. You go there, the city is booming. The energy is amazing. In fact, retail works. You know, it's not like some of the stores that we see on Fifth or Madison Avenue that are so depressing locked in. No, no, everything works in London. And it's the world's evergreen city and the world's evergreen investment destination. You take new cities like Madrid, another one, Berlin. Again, they've invested uh, and they've repositioned themselves during the pandemic and so on and so forth. There are cities that sadly are falling behind, that have not invested in infrastructure, that have social issues. I'm sure you can all guess which ones those are. I am concerned about those cities from an investment perspective. Okay. And we have uh, some audience questions. So from David, uh, this one I think Arash might go for you. So if consumers are members of all our most loyalty programs, which is a point yeah. brought up in the last panel, uh, do portfolio management companies expect that they'll develop their own uh, one password data uh, to retain these customers? Maybe I'm getting that first party data, I'm sorry. Yeah, first, I, I think it's, it's difficult to have one sole source holder of uh, loyalty points, but I was, I'm going to put a plug in for uh, for Expedia now. I hope Tyler is not in the room, but they yeah. just start, oh, oh shit, there he is. Tyler is here. <laughs> uh, but they just started a loyalty program, which you know we helped and we are partnering with them on. That is a sole source loyalty program that you can put your book your use your loyalty points for airlines, for hotels, for car rental, and I think that's the wave of the future where people want to be able to have a sole source solution. You know, we, we start, we're starting our own loyalty program. It's more recognition program, it's more reward program, it's more getting to know our customers better, but we can't you know, start fighting with the Marriott's and Hyatt's and Hilton's of the world. I don't, ever, I don't see it in the near future, in my opinion, that there's going to be one program that's gonna encompass all of that because that data is proprietary and these companies can't share that data with others. So um, I'm not recommending you all go on Expedia to book. Please go direct to your hotels and book. But if you wanna, if you want to, you can always use that source as well. Okay. Lightning round question, Hilda, from Margaret on the ESG front about labor. Is labor something that either Actus investors or the shareholders, the Black Rocks of the world, care about? And you're seeing that's bubbled up in any markets in the world. Yeah, for sure, a little bit, but they're more focused on the labor issue as a profitability issue. Right okay. Now, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, when we're f when they're focused on the S, is more what contribution do they have in the immediate community with it, where they serve. Now, um, you know, it is linked. Uh, one out of every ten jobs are held in the travel and tourism industry worldwide, so we are one of the biggest employers of people, and it so happens that most seventy percent of those people are women. So yes, they will be rewarding. Um, you know, staff retention, et cetera. But, you know, obviously uh, people do have very good muscle memory. We have to put humanity and uh, dignity back into hotel jobs. You know, I'm a firm believer of that. And again, because so many of these laborers or workers are women, uh, we absolutely need to do a better job at paying them for fairly, offering them a career path and job security. So yes, those who do it are gonna do fine. Well, that's an eloquent and rousing point to end on. Thank you, Hilda. Thank you, Arash. Thank you. Thank you.